Hey guys, remember Fargo, Season 3, Episode 7, The Law of Inevitability, and I was definitely looking forward to this episode more than uh, most of the season, because as you guys know, the last episode really did take a turn, it really did, um, you know, as we know, uh, Ray was now dead, which I'm still in disbelief over, I can't believe the show would kill off such a major character like Ray this early in the show, it's a very ballsy move, um, but... I was very interested in seeing where the show was really going to go, and this was another really great episode. Uh, I really did love what we got here. I thought there was some really interesting stuff going on within this episode, and it seems that a lot of what, you know, Varga has told Emmett to do, he is very much sticking with, and this is something I do like, so we're getting a lot more time with Emmett and things like that. Uh, we, we did see a lot of glory as well, a lot more than we did in the last episode, but let's just get this episode because there definitely is a lot to talk about. Again, I know, guys, I'm very behind on a lot of shows right now. I'm going to try to take this week and catch up. I got Better Call Saul, I got Pre Little Liars, I got Fargo, I got Originals, I got Handmaid's, so all this kind of stuff that I need to watch, and uh, I'm going to try to finish most, if not all, this week, because I really, I mean, Thursday's going to be crazy because I'm graduating, but other than that, I think I will have the time to do that, so let's just get into it. I love the way this episode starts, because uh, we start off where we hear this Christmas music playing. We're reminded the show takes place in December, and Varga's cutting open gifts, and he's kneeling in front of this gorgeous Christmas tree. He tries out the contents of each present as a massive taxidermy bear watches over the uh, unwrapping, and he's literally, like, cutting them open with knives and things like that. Just a really brutal scene and things, you know, just a really, um, really, um, crazy stuff going on there. Just, uh... <laughs> In general, Varga's always been such a menacing presence, and this really doesn't make him any less than he's been, so we then see Gloria, she arrives at Ray's house and finds him dead on the floor, face down in a pool of blood. Now, of course, we know what happened here, Winnie looks over her shoulder, and Gloria appropriately says shit, because what else can you say? I mean, when you walk in something like that, where there's just blood everywhere, and it's so graphic and so brutal, what else do you really have to say to that? So... Nikki's back in her hotel room, and Nikki's the character that you have to feel the worst for. I mean, think about Nikki. I mean, this, you know, whatever previous relationships she felt to Ray, I've said it before, I don't always know if Nikki loved Ray like he did, but she definitely did love him. I mean, she, I don't think she would have said yes. I don't think she just married him for money and things like that. I think she genuinely really did care about Ray a lot, and, uh, you really do see that, you know, she is at a loss here, and she's mourning throughout this episode a lot, and especially knowing what Varga means to do with her, I mean, how can you not feel bad for her? I really did feel terrible for her throughout this episode, but again, Mary Liz and Winstead just killed it here. She's back in her hotel room alone. She's glancing occasionally at the room's phone. Um... Because remember, she doesn't know Ray's whereabouts. She's completely out of the know right now. And housekeeping the knocks at the door. She tentatively approaches the window for a couple reasons. One, as we know, she's trying to get the hell away from Yuri and Mimo because they attacked her and she knows that they're coming after her. She also kind of wants to get her stake at them. Um, but also the fact that, again, she doesn't know where Ray is right now. So suddenly two officers with guns drawn crash through the door. And we see uh, Dammit calls Nikki back into the bathroom after finding her attempting to crawl out the window. Nikki is placed in the squad car's officer to gather the contents of her room, and again, she has no idea what's going on. I mean, all of a sudden, these officers just came into her room, you know, why is she being questioned, what's really going on here? We have to remember that Nikki was, in fact, a criminal, and Ray was her parole officer, and, you know, obviously, because of circumstances that she's not completely off the hook, as we know, so obviously, you know, makes sense why they are targeting her, but to know that she's not at all the cause, and also was completely out of the know about Ray's death, makes this all the more uh, heartbreaking to watch, I have to say. Definitely, like I said, of all the characters, she's really the one I feel the worst for. So we then see Emmett, who I have to say, again, is, is, more, is a lot more important than he's been from here on, because... While we did see a lot of Emmett throughout these, you know, six or six or seven episodes that we've had, um, now it's even more, uh, you know, imperative because of the fact that Ray is not there and the fact that Emmett's here. It, obviously, his story is becoming a lot more interesting, and I'm glad that we do see a lot of Emmett here. Uh, and I, I think it made sense when they did that because I've said it before to other people I've had conversations with who are also in disbelief over Ray. Uh, that I think the reason they did it, why they decided to kill Ray, is because Ray looked too similar to Emmett. Remember, he shaved and he got the haircut and things like that. Sure, he still had the long hair, but. 
in general, if they were to continue, it w I think it would have been hard to make a distinction between the two because of the fact that Ray didn't have that mustache anymore, and uh, that was kind of the thing that made those two so different. So, we see Emmett, he's fresh off murdering his brother, and following Varga's instructions, Emmett has actually kept his dinner date with Cy and potential investor Ruby Goldfarb, and he... To everyone else, you know, it was like, oh, this has been going on the whole time. So he is sticking with this story as much as possible. Because again, in his mind, he believes that Varga is going to do things in his favor. We know obviously that's not the case, but Emmett's kind of been led on to think that. So he attempts to act normal, he orders a drink, and he makes a toast to new friends, and uh, again, he's just acting like everything's fine, you know, he has no idea about, uh, what happened with Ray. So, meanwhile, da Chief Damick has Nikki in interrogation room and shows her a photo of Ray dead, and he- <coughs> Excuse me. He wonders if she has cuts and bruises, and why a girl like her was with a guy like Ray. Why Why would you do something like that? I mean, this is a parole officer, you're a criminal, you're not supposed to like each other. And I think that's something that really does work with Fargo, is that it's not so much about, you know, who you are uh, externally, it's about who you are internally. Yes, Nikki is a criminal, and yes, Ray is a parole officer, but I think Nikki is as good-natured as Ray, and Ray is as much of a criminal as Nikki. I mean, that's kind of what we saw. I mean, Ray, he played as much of a role in Maurice's murder as Nikki did. You know, it wasn't either way. I think that's kind of what they're trying to show here. So he goes over a criminal record, and he's sure that she was with Ray only because he was her parole officer. Obviously, that's not the reason why, but she asked for a lawyer, but he advised her to push the tearjerker story that Ray was a monster, and Nikki just doesn't answer. And uh, Damick then leaves her alone with a photo of Ray just in case she wants to to admire her handiwork, and again, you know, he's led to believe that there is no other options here. Again, that's something about Damick that we've seen. He's so close-minded, he thinks there's only, you know, one story, and he's not thinking of anything else. He's saying, all right, Nikki's here, you know, she's in the interrogation room, she's a criminal. It all kind of does make sense, and, you know, for the first time, sure, I've been like, oh, Damick, I think it's too hard on Glory or too hard on Winnie. This time, however, I'm with him, because as far as he knows, there's no other possible story, and it seems like that is the most logical um, possibility, is that Nikki had to have been the one that did it. So, she picks up the phone, she notices something the police are probably, uh, missed. You know, she know obviously that being that this was, um, you know, a shard of glass, and that's something they're just not picking up on. So, Gloria and Winnie are called in to speak with Chief Damick and St. Cloud's police chief, and the St. Cloud chief tells Gloria and Winnie to go back to their normal assignments as the homicide unit's taking over. You know, this is done. We know exactly what's going on here. We don't need you anymore. But Gloria blows us off as they speak to Nikki, and she's not impressed with Damick when he reveals he's already spoken with Nikki, and she tells the St. Cloud police chief that she has a detailed account of the homicides and how they're connected, and he has no idea why she's working on uh, multiple murders. You know, he has no idea about that. Damick again tries to shut her down. She ignores him and lays out the three murder victims, and she explains they've deduced it all stems from a rivalry between Emmett and the newly deceased Grace Dusty, which we know that's exactly what went down. So, you know, Gloria, she's got all the information she needs. She knows very well what's going on. She's done her history very well. Uh, while Damick, again, continues to be very close minded I really do like seeing that contrast between Gloria, who is willing to get all the facts and knows that there definitely is more of the story than just what Damick thinks, and Damick, who is so close minded you know, he can't really think of anything else rather than what's directly presented to him while Gloria actually does the legwork. It just really does show the contrast in these two, and that's something I really do love about Gloria as a character, is the way she is so, um you know, the, the, the way she is so cognizant about that stuff, and how she is so intuitive and always tries to gather as much information as possible. I really do love the our character, and that's something I really have loved about this particular story. So, meanwhile, you got the St. Cloud Police Department, and they are basically just as dismissive as Damick. They want nothing to do. Gloria, even after doing this quick recap of three homicides, telling him, look, these are all connected, and this is very well what happened, basically giving him a rundown of what she knows, they're just not interested. They're so closed-minded, and they think they know what's going on, they just don't care. So they're sent out of the room, damning the St. Cloud Police Chief talk, and Gloria tells Winnie they have to find Emmett and gauge his reaction to the news that Ray has been murdered, because she knows there's definitely more going on here, and she very well thinks that Emmett could be connected to, which again, it just shows how smart she is and how much information she really has gotten. And sure, some people could say, oh, it's very obvious, but I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the obvious answer is that Nikki murdered Ray. That would have been the obvious thing, but that's not what's going on here. It's not the obvious way to die. In fact, 
Nobody killed Ray. He did it himself. He killed himself out of stubbornness. It's He didn't want to listen to Emmett. And Emmett, remember, he was ready to put that feud aside him. But, of course, because of what happened, obviously, you know, that's, that's kind of why it all kind of escalated from there. So, basically, she sends Winnie off. Dana confronts her with basically two choices. Either she takes time off and grieve until she's no longer officially police chief or she's just going to quit. So, either way, he wants nothing to do with her. He thinks that, she, you know, he's done all she's done all she needs to do she knows obviously that's not the case and uh she signals that she's taking time off but she sneaks back in a restricted area because there's no way she's just gonna stop this case i mean she's worked so diligently on it there's no way she's gonna stop now so she has to see nikki unfortunately she stopped by an officer who needs her to see her interview request form before he can allow her to speak to nikki uh you know he needs to make sure that she has that request form so over in Ian Valley, we see Officer Donnie Mashman. He's called to investigate a case of vandalism, and he locks up the station and hangs a sign indicating that he'll be back in 15 minutes. And as he's about to get into his car, he notices that he actually forgot his gun, and he walks back to the station. The door's unlocked, and at first, he just thinks he forgot to lock it. You know, that's kind of what he thought happened. But then he heads into his office, and he sees this chair in another room swiveling on its own. He calls out, but no one answers. And this scene was so well done. I mean, the thrills here were so great. You have no idea what's going on. You know it's probably the work of Varga, but everything about this was just so well staged, and it was like a horror movie, honestly. This entire scene was kind of like a horror movie, and... He cautiously looks around the office library, and he finds Yuri just casually leaning against a, share, a, a shelf for reading something, and Donnie's asking him to leave, and Yuri says he's gone. He claims he's n really not there anymore, and uh, Donnie's now completely confused. You know, what, is he saying that he's a ghost? What's going on? Donnie's frightened when Yuri approaches him, telling him that he's talking to himself, so Yuri's trying to make him think that he's just a ghost, and he instructs Donnie to pick up his gun, and after he does, Yuri tells him to leave, and for some reason, Donnie just obeys and rushes outside to his car, and I think it's just because of how terrifying Yuri is. That's why Donnie's so obedient. But after he pulls away, Yuri then puts the Enes, the uh, Enes Stussy file back where he found it. So clearly they're trying to do something with said file. They know obviously, um, they're, you know, they're, they're obviously know that there's a lot connected to that. And I think they're trying to get that story out of the picture so they can keep this, you know, fake narrative of, oh, it was all Nikki's fault. You know, that's clearly the story they're trying to stick with. So we go back to Emmett, and he's still at the restaurant with uh, Ruby and Sai, and they talk about retirement, and Sai is actually ready to get their attorney started in the paperwork, and Emmett then changes the subject to talk about marriages, sex tapes, and deadbeats who want money from rich people. So... Ruby concedes the money is a blessing and a curse, and Emmett says that sore losers are to blame, not the money, and Sai is uncomfortable during all of this, and he then spots Winnie in the restaurant lobby. So Sai, again, he can tell that something definitely is going on, and you know, he thinks she's there to harass them, uh, because of everything that went down with Sai, and, I mean, with everything that went down with Varga, and all the sort of, like, embezzlement things that's been going on, so he heads over to confront her before she can make it to their table, and she delivers the bad news about Ray, and then Sai motions Emmett to meet with Winnie, and in a scene that, again, very well shows what Fargo does. This scene was actually really funny. Like, it could have been really serious, but because Emmett's trying to keep his cool, it was actually quite funny here. And Emmett then walks over as they stare at him, and before Wayne can say anything about Ray, Emmett blurts out he's been to the restaurant since 6 p.m. He has nothing to do with it. You can tell he's just doing whatever he can to stick with this story, and he's talking way too much, which just makes him a lot more, uh, guilt, you know, guilty and shady than he sounds, and Winnie doesn't really know what to make of it. I mean, this guy's just talking 90 miles a minute, uh, before she can get word in edgewise and neither does I you know he is completely uh in, you know he, he's just completely bewildered here what the hell is he going on what are you doing what are you talking about and when he finally tells Emmett that Ray is dead and Emmett simply stares and says Raymond he does he doesn't ask how or why and instead immediately jumps to blaming it on Nikki so again not exactly doing a good job with making himself sound innocent. So he suggests the cops just bring her in, and the fact that he had no reaction towards this, I mean, again, it just, it doesn't make him sound very, um, innocent. You know, of course, that's the story that Varga's trying to do, but by Emmett saying all this stuff over and over again, it just, it makes him sound a lot more shady. So, Sai is trying to cover for Emmett, who blames the loose talk on the alcohol that they've had over dinner, and Emmett calls Nikki a black widow who used his brother. Emmett doesn't cry, he's not doing a convincing job of looking 
being upset. He just seems like this is just, you know, it seems like he's just, it's uh, just simply asking, like, you know, where's Ray or something like that. Like, just like a simple question. This doesn't really seem like something that's that big of a deal. So, Sasha suggests that Winnie talk to their lawyer if she needs a statement. And when she asks Emmett about the last time he saw Ray, Emmett says that he was there all night and Sai repeats that she needs to call their attorney. Sai calls Ray a saint who meant well as Emmett does a horrible job of looking upset. And after Emmett and Sai leave, Winnie asks Ruby if she can ask her a few questions. And again, you can just tell, while some people are doing a really good job, Emma is definitely not one of those people that's keeping up appearances very well, and because of how good we know Winnie and Gloria have been, this just makes him more suspicious than he already was. So Sai and Emmett then arrive at Emmett's place, and Sai is ready to make funeral arrangements. Obviously, he knows that Ray died, let's give him a funeral. And he also assures Emmett that he'll talk to Ruby and make sure that she does back up their story. So Sai then asks if Emmett is, uh, thinks that Varga killed Ray, but Emmett's got his own theory. He believes that Sai and Ray were conspiring together, as we know. that. But this is what Varga kind of put into his head. You know, Sai and the old timing of Ray's request for money after the coming's finally in the back plus Ray's entry into his safety deposit box. Again, uh, Psy is one of the only people here, I've said it before, Psy's one of the only sane people on this show. He's one of the only people who isn't just gonna give in to Psy. He's very much, um, you know, he, he's kind of like uh, the, you know, I don't know exactly how what you say, but he is the rational one. Like, he knows very well what's going on here because, you know, he tells Emmett, wait a second here, how could we possibly be conspiring together? And why would we be? Because, as we know, I mean, Ray's not rich. That'd be turning millions of dollars into thousands of dollars, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, Ray, you know, he was the one that was the parole officer and was demanding money to Emmett, so why would he be working for Ray? It, it just, it makes no sense. On paper, it doesn't make sense in any way, and Emmett then apologized, saying he's under a lot of pressure, and he doesn't really know who to trust at this point, and I can understand that. I mean, on one hand, you got Varga, who's telling him you can't trust Sai, but then you have Sai, who clearly is kind of sticking to his story and is kind of helping him out, so he's really starting to crack, you can tell, and Sai then says he can always trust him and thinks they need to take the money from Ruby and run. It's their only way out of this horrible situation, that if they just run away, then they're fine. We know that's not going to happen because this is Fargo, but I, I don't think it's going to happen at least, but that's kind of what Sai thinks they should do. So, inside his house, Emmett is sitting on the stairs. He's He's been uh, leading to the second floor. He's right next to the Christmas tree, and, the, and he presents Varga that had been going through earlier. Uh, Varga takes a seat on the opposite side of the stairs, and he asks Emmett how he really feels, and he answers, his answer is free, and, uh, I think it's interesting that Emmett says that, and I think what he means by that is that now he doesn't have as much pressure. Thing is, though, yeah, he does, actually. I mean, you got Gloria and Winnie, who are two very competent police officers who actually know what they're doing and know there's more of the story, so he kind of thinks that he's a little bit more free than he is, and... Uh, Varga then tells him a story about there was a crooked man nursery rhyme, and, uh, again, there's just something so menacing, uh, and so watchable, uh, just something that you have to watch as Varga narrates the story, I and mean, you can tell he's trying to do this to help him out, but at the same time, it's kind of creepy, so... Sai makes it to his house as his wife makes small talk, and he just stands there. She takes off his jacket, she talks about their kids and butterscotch pudding, and only then he starts to break down crying. And she asks what's wrong, and he replies, the world, that the world is what's wrong. And I would agree with that. I mean, especially the world that Sai's living in, it's just kind of messed everything up. And uh, he says everything in his world is now different. She hugs him, holding him close as he cries. And I mean, that's very much true. We've known Sai before. He will do anything for Emmett, you know, whether it's running away, whether it's trying to conspire against Ray. I mean, he'll do anything for him. And the fact that Emmett is now working with Varga, it doesn't really seem like he's trusting Sai. This really is starting to have a very visceral effect on him, and I mean, I really do love seeing that. Michael Stolberg is just so great in this role, and uh, I'll be very surprised if he doesn't get an Emmy nomination, because he's really killing it, I have to say. I'm really more we're getting from him here, but back at the St. Cloud Police Station, Gloria hasn't given up on trying to speak with Nikki. She actually requests a blue interview form, but since she's not from St. Cloud, she must get her superior officer to sign the form, and when she has to sign it herself because she's chief of Eden Valley, the officers tell her that's not allowed. First, she has to get the St. Cloud's police chief's signature, then they're two more films to fill out. So she completes situation while alone in the bathroom, just not really knowing what to do, seeing how outnumbered she is, even though she does have Winnie, um, 
they're both very much outnumbered. I mean, the police are kind of winning here, and obviously, she knows there's more of the story, but no one really seems to want her to, you know, say... <coughs> <coughs> no one really seems to want her to do anything, and, uh... You can very much tell this is messing with, uh, you know, Gloria in every way. So we then get this incredible scene with Nikki where she's looking around the holding cell for a way to escape because she knows very well she does not belong here. I mean, yes, she's a criminal. And, I mean, yeah, she's used to escaping, but she also does not belong here. She knows she's not the killer. And an officer arrives, tells her to turn around, puts her hands through the bars because he has to check herself for contraband, and... Nikki figures out that something's going on. I mean, this is not just some normal officer. She's never seen this dude in her life, but not until after she's handcuffed and can't escape. Even after she's handcuffed, I mean, they don't let her go. So the officer about to inject her with a syringe. Glory arrives, holds him at gunpoint. She tells him to put the syringe on the floor. He makes like he's going to obey before knocking her down. She gets one shot off before the man flees, and the gunshot that brings in cops who restrain her, and Chief Damick also appears, and both Gloria and Nikki say syringe on the floor is a murder weapon. But again, Damick doesn't really believe them, so he picks up the syringe, demands to know why he should believe it's not Nikki's, and Gloria tells him to check the tape. They all look at the surveillance cameras, and Chief Damick, Gloria, and the officer in charge of surveillance watch the video, but it freezes moments before the incident really took place. And this was the part where I'm like, really? I mean, this just seemed really convenient. Like, we have to stick to this story of Damick not catching on any point, and he thinks it's a glitch, but Gloria believes that it was going to be the fourth murder of the series she's investigating, and she's frustrated, says that they should talk to Nikki, even if this is all one big coincidence, and they need to get to the bottom of the murder spree if possible, and they finally seem to agree, so it actually seems like they are going to talk to her, because maybe Gloria's on to something, and I like that Damick is starting to come around here, so they talk to Nikki, she makes it clear she doesn't want Ray cut open, and Gloria asks the idea and the man with a syringe... Revealing your theory that Ray hired Maurice to rob Emmett, and it's just snowballed from there, which is basically kind of what happened. I mean, the only part she doesn't know is that Maurice went to the wrong house. And Gloria also says that she thinks that Emmett came back at Ray hard, and Nikki finally adds the conversation, telling her it wasn't the brother, and to follow the money. Basically that. She knows it's not the brother that did it, and Gloria asks what money. Nikki doesn't give her an answer. Gloria says her son is at home worried someone's coming for him since next they, since uh, next since they murdered his grandfather. But Nikki still won't say anything. And Chief Damick revokes Nikki's probation. She's gonna They're going to transfer her to the state penitentiary where she'll be in protective custody and as he's leaving he as the jury will convict her even if there was a nutbag with a syringe uh, no matter what happened I mean she is going to be arrested because as far as they know there's no other you know she's not giving him any other options here so Gloria asks if Nikki likes pie. She says she'll visit her after the holidays to talk about Ray, and as she's about to close the door, Nikki says she likes coconut cream pie with chocolate flakes, and I like the way that Nikki's trying to help her out here, so, I mean, the way that Gloria's trying to help her out. So Gloria watches Nikki's escort from the station by two officers. She makes it onto the transport bus, and she's handcuffed in the last seat of the back of the bus. The full bus heads to the state pen, but the trip comes to a sudden halt. When this man walks in front of the bus and it swerves to avoid hitting him, the bus crashes and flips onto its side, with the prisoners tossed about inside, and she's knocked out, and we see, um, she's actually standing right next to Mr. Wrench, yes, the Mr. Wrench, the one who, of course, can't talk, uh, from season one, and as the episode ends, we see Yuri, he's wearing a bear head, he begins cutting through the metal cage to get to the area holding the prisoners, and obviously, he's going to make sure that Nikki doesn't get away, and that is how this episode ends, really incredible stuff overall, but let's just get this episode and where this is going to take us, uh, into the last three episodes of the show. Well, overall, guys, this was another really amazing episode, but again, there is a lot to talk about moving forward. Uh, let's first talk about Nikki because, holy shit, I mean, Nikki at this point, if you didn't feel bad for her, I don't know how you can't feel bad for her after this episode. Uh, you know, the fact that she is kind of just, you know, she's sitting at home, terrified that Yuri and Mimo are gonna come get her, whether, even though she's well prepared, you know, if they are, like, she'll, she'll kill them if she has to, cause, I mean, I think she'd be able to, at the same time, she's terrified, I mean, they beat the shit out of her, and basically left her near death, uh, you don't just forget something like that, that's something that kind of haunts you forever, and, uh, you know, already she's on edge because of that, not knowing where Ray is, and then just randomly these officers come in and arrest her. I mean, it's a lot for one person to handle. And what I really do love is the way they're humanizing Nikki. Since the beginning, they really have, but now that Ray is gone, this gives us even more of a chance to look into Nikki's worldview. Is she really as good as Ray thought she was? Uh, did she really care about Ray? And 
this episode, I think, confirms that, yes, she does, in fact, care about Ray. She very much did love him. She very much does, um care about him, uh, but she just, she did not like the feud, she wanted to end, as we know, she wanted to put it, you know, to do whatever she can, but because of the fact that it was so ongoing, she helped Ray concoct all sort of plans, not really thinking it would escalate to this, but that's exactly what happened, it has, in fact, escalated to this, and that's at least what I'm getting, I mean, I could be wrong, but at least from what I've seen, you know, Nikki's not someone who, um, is in fact trying, you know, she wasn't using Ray in any way. And that's kind of what the chief is being led to believe that, oh, she was just using Ray. He's going along with Varga's story. Um, but I do like the way it's just starting to have a very visceral effect on not just, you know, Emmett, but everyone really. I mean, everyone's starting to have an effect. You can see that Emmett, he's really starting to crack. I mean, whatever happened with Varga, it really is starting to change him, as we know. You know, Sai's telling him you can't trust Varga, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the only person that Emmett has relied on this entire time. He's thought that Psy, he can't trust, so he doesn't really know what to do. Even Psy is starting to crack as well. You know, we can see that Psy, he can tell that uh, Emmett really doesn't trust him right now. Because of that, he doesn't really know what his purpose is because he's been so loyal to Emmett. What else is he supposed to do now? I mean, this is, this is someone he's relied on from day one, so what else can he do? I don't really know, but I really did love the way that uh, that was all done. I mean, Michael Stolberg just acted the hell out of that scene. Um, as far as Varga, it does look like Emmett is continuing to give in to Varga, and you can understand why. I mean, again, from this point on, Varga hasn't really shown him any other direction. He hasn't really, you know, double-crossed him or anything. He is going too soon. I know something is definitely going to happen, and Emmett is going to come around. We're near the end of the season. That's going to happen. Emmett's going to confess. I mean, I think the guilt is going to get to him, and you can tell every time he can't even keep his cool. I mean, when he was with Winnie, he was talking so fast. He wasn't acting naturally. I mean, uh, that's just not how you react when you find out your brother died. It's not. That's not at all how you react, and especially, you know, because to them, that was supposed to be the first time, and that just made it even more shady, so I do like the way that Gloria and Winnie are really piecing this together. They can very much tell what's going on. I really do love the way that's going. Who is this unknown assassin that Nikki just ran into? What's that's all about? We don't really know. And how is Mr. Wrench going to help her? I love that Mr. Wrench is returning. I think definitely it makes the most sense. You know, every season is connected things in some way. And it seems like that's going to be the connection. It's going to be Mr. Wrench. And I think it makes the most sense for them to do that. Uh, but overall, guys, this was another really fantastic episode. I really did love what we had going on here. My only complaint, really, just Chief Danik is kind of starting to piss me off, I have to say. The fact that he's not listening to Gloria, um, I like that he's starting to come around, but even then, I mean, I, I get it, honestly. I get it that he feels like that's the only option. I understand that, but in general, I think he's just an annoying character. It works, though. I think it makes sense why they did that. I don't really have many complaints with this episode. I really did love this one overall, and I'm definitely going to give Fargo Season 3, Episode 7, The Law of Inevitability, a 4.5 out of 5, or an A-. minus. So over, guys, we this episode of Fargo. Lawrence, guys, saw this episode overall. Love your thoughts. And I really am absolutely loving this season, I have to say. I mean, it took me a while, but since episode five, it's just really been better and better as it's gone on. But that's my review. Hope you enjoyed it. Lawrence, guys, saw this episode overall. Love your thoughts. And we'll see you guys in my next video, which I think will be for episode eight of Fargo. And I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.